Hey everyone, this is James Labrie from Dream Theater, and you're listening to Prog Rock Digital. Welcome to Prog Rock Digital. Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Prog Rock Digital. This is episode 5 of season 3. Thank you very much for downloading and streaming. Thank you for visiting progrockdigital.com and please keep those emails coming through. Now today I'm chatting with Jordan Rudez from the band Dream Theatre. I caught Jordan about a week and a half back whilst he was on his solo dates He dialed in from Denver, Colorado, and, well, it was an interesting chat. We spoke about Dream Theater, the Grammy, and, well, uh, Jordan Solo stuff, and, you know, just a general conversation in and around Dream Theater. So, uh, you know, greatly appreciated, thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think you're going to love this too. The man behind some of the most iconic pieces of art connected to some of the biggest names in rock... Ioannis, originally from Athens, Greece, in the last 36 years has created over 300 record covers for such clients as King Crimson, Fate's Warning, Uriah Heap, Allman Brothers, Blue Oyster Cult, Leonard Skinner, Ingve Malmsteen, Deep Purple, Styx, just to name a few. Be sure to connect with Ioannis at www.dangerousage.com. Coming July 30th, the re-release of Amarin's Plight, Voice in the Light, featuring Gary Workamp, DC Cooper and Nick DiVigilio. One of the greatest progressive conceptual albums of the 2000s is with us once again. www.amarinsplight.net Out through Lone Wolf Music. False Set have released their debut album, We Follow or Lead the Way. Available for download and stream, visit falseset.co. Hey everybody, it's Mark Zonder with A to Z with the first exclusive Australian interview with Prog Rock Digital. Jordan Rudez, welcome to Prog Rock Digital. How's it going, man? I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, good. Now, my uh, my understanding is that you're dialing in from Denver, Colorado. Are you on vacation or is this uh, an evening with uh, Jordan Rudez of Dream Theater or, or is it both? <laughs> it's door number two. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm playing. I'm playing tonight. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, this this month and next month, I've got a bunch of uh, solo shows. So I'm hopping around the uh, country, and that's why I'm out here. So, Jordan, can I ask, what's it like um, putting forward your own stuff, putting forward solo stuff in a live setting, away from the 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 normal <laughs> dream theater setting or situation? Yeah. Uh, it's something that's, you know, really, really important to me. It's, uh, you know, my, my musical path has been very diverse and I have a lot of different stylistic things that I like to do and that are, that are like crucial to my being. And, uh, you know, I started with classical piano and, and I kind of discovered synthesizers after that and got into electronic music and somewhere along the line, prog rock became, you know, a very important thing to me as well, but there's just so much more. So doing the solo shows gives me an opportunity to go and kind of express myself in all the ways that, you know, I really need to as a musician. Mm. And, and Jordan, look, you've, you've just come off uh, the most recent dream theater tour You've just completed the first uh, leg of that tour, and that's promoting A View from the Top of the World, which uh, I reviewed on this uh, podcast uh, back when it was released, back in October. Now, let me ask you, has the tour thus far, you know, if you like, reached the uh, the expectations of, of you guys? You know, obviously we're in, we're in a, a period of COVID um, 
you know, hangover. How has it all gone? Yeah. I mean, it, there's a noticeable energy in the room when we play. I mean, we knew that it would be really fun to get out there, but when we are on stage and playing, it can get very kind of uh, intense and, and emotional really soon because you can tell that people were really hungry for, you know, live music and, and, um, you know, it just feels great to be out there and playing. And really every, every um, country, every state that we've gone to is very different, uh, you know, in terms of their rules, in terms of you know what's going on. And so, you know, you can, it's all over the board, especially a group like, you know, Dream Theater, uh, where we play internationally and basically everywhere. So every night is a different story. But I would say that the overriding theme of the, you know, of being out there again, it's just this kind of joy, not only just the the audience like kind of like generating this and you know the level of engagement but also just the band we're just loving playing and it's it's great to great to do it again so what was it like uh, winning your very first grammy award for the the alien obviously off the most recent album what does that mean for you and the band um so you know it's interesting because the grammy Thing was something that for so many years was really outside of what we kind of felt like we were, or we were doing. We didn't think it was even possible. It was kind of like, here we are in prog metal, prog rock, and uh, this is the range of possibilities. And then you have like the commercial world. We have things like Grammys and all this stuff. So it wasn't until more recent times that um, we kind of, adjusted our own perspective about it as well as the record company kind of changed their way of thinking about it and i think that was the first step to kind of like putting us in front of you know the more uh i don't know i guess i can call it commercial world and grammys and you know we started to kind of play in that arena and of course we got you know, nominated and then we got nominated again. And then the third time we got nominated, we won. So for us, it's, it's awesome. I mean, the the great thing about it is that, well, I guess number one is that this opens up the door to so, so many great musicians. I mean, it's wonderful that we won and I'm, I'm thrilled and, you know, excited, but I just feel like, you know, this, this allows the world to really, notice some of these amazing you know musicians who haven't been noticed you know by things like the grammys before that's that's really really exciting you know um but like you know john petrucci said at the said at the grammys like the song that we won for was in 178 <laughs> so it was like pretty you know really odd time signature so it's pretty amazing um so we we're all we're all really thrilled. You know, the other thing about the Grammys is that let's face it, you know, it's the first thing that, you know, anybody and everybody is going to kind of say in a resume, a bio, when they introduce you and they talk to, they talk about you, you know, whatever you, whatever you think about the Grammys, it's the reality is it's, uh, it's really something that really matters to a lot of people. And it also opens doors and uh, it's, it's awesome. So, has there been a noticeable change in the way in which it's affected the band or is it still too early to see the, you know, that movement um, or, or is it, you know, business as usual for, for dream theater? Well, I just think that we're just, we just feel, you know, really good about all our hard work. It's not really going to change anything in terms of like, the kind of music we, we're not all of a sudden going to start writing pop songs. Um, but I think that it just allows us to feel like we're a little bit wider, a little bit, you know, like where our reach is, a, is, is, is bigger in the world. And, and that's, that's awesome. You know, we've been doing this for a long time and, you know, to get, to get that kind of recognition by your peers is, uh, is great. It's important. And I think of anything, it might give us a little bit of, I don't know, a little more confidence moving forward and yeah it's just kind of like that so what's a, a day in a life of dream theater like on tour from the from the time you wake up in the morning to you know the time you rest your head on your uh you know pillow 
So everybody's a little bit different. My my day in the life is basically crawl off the tour bus, you know, like 10 a.m. <laughs> and kind of try to avoid any any direct eye contact because I'm you know slept in a, slept in a in a bunk bed all night. <laughs> and my beard is probably pointing up, and it's really funny because you go into these hotels and some of them are really nice, and mm. you know it's like the, there might be somebody right at the door just to welcome you, and I'm like <laughs> my feeling is like don't talk to me, don't look at me, just let me walk <laughs> by, you know <laughs> I'll see you later. Um, but you know of course they're very friendly, they want to show you the elevator and anyway so you you make your way you make your way to your room trying to to use the harry potter invisibility cloak <laughs> which doesn't seem to work uh for us and then um what i generally do is i'm delirious for probably around uh an hour or so and then I just put my stuff like down and I just go out for a walk because the most important thing to me when I'm touring like that, like we're away for whatever, six weeks and, you know, on this, these bus trips is to get light and get air and to walk. So I literally have walked probably every city on this planet. <laughs> like I'll just go out and I'll walk and I'll walk for a few miles or whatever, you know, and hopefully there's something around to see a nice city or you know, maybe grab a Starbucks or some food or something like that. And then I come back and, you know, it's usually something that I need to to get done just business-wise or whatever. Or, you know, these days I'll be practicing some guitar because I'm trying to uh, kind of uh, graduate my skills on the guitar lately. So I do a little of that. I do a little of that in the room as well. And, um, and then around three o'clock, we have to head down because that's when we generally check out. Uh, and we go over to the venue and we do a little sound check. We hang out, uh, we have dinner, you know, and I have a little dressing room piano that I can, uh, that I can bang on and work on or warm up. And then we do the show and then, uh, you know, and then we get back on the bus and repeat. So speaking of going for a walk, have you ever been spotted, um, by any fans, you know, and, and what are the, what have some of the reactions been like in, in spotting Jordan Rudez? Mm. Well, if I'm walking around a general city that's far from the venue, that you know, it's usually not not a problem. I mean, usually, you know, a couple of people stop me along the way that no dream theater or whatever, but and but that's pretty that's pretty laid back. You know, in a big city, there's a lot of people and you can kind of move into the shuffle of things pretty well. Um, you know, it becomes a little bit more crazy if I decide to, or if the hotel is near the venue, or, you know, if I step out of the venue for a walk, then, you know, then you're surrounded by the dream theater fan community and you gotta, you know, do that with, with caution. So, uh, but dream theater is at this kind of, but we're, we're kind of at a good point, you know, as far as our, you know, fame where I, I can walk around the city and, and be left alone, you know, which is nice. So, Jordan, with keyboards, piano being such a massive part of your life and, and obviously a, a pivotal part of DT, um, what is your practice regime like? You know, what types of exercises do you incorporate in your plan? Uh, you know, are they scales, uh, broken chords, block chords? You know, how many octaves yeah. do you go up and down? I mean, is is it as, as regimented as that or it, – is there a, a different process? Um, you know, I've been playing the piano for 57 years now, and I and I studied at Juilliard when I was a really young person. And so when I was younger, I practiced, you know, three, four, five hours a day. Um, and it would be, you know, it would be absolute, you know, you're going to sit at that piano, you're going to do work on whatever the recital that was coming up and, and do that. But I also... Um, you know, I learned some amazing exercises, my exercises on the keyboard. I learned how to take care of my hands. I learned what I need to do to stay in really, you know, good, good mechanical, physical shape to play the instrument. And I've never let that go. I don't, I don't practice like, you know, um, every day, like three, four, five hours a day, but, um, but I am still a hard worker. Like before I come out to do solo shows, you know, I'll sit there and I will spend, you know, hours just working on things and doing stuff. And I, and I also, 
will do the exercises that I feel are needed for my hands. I do a lot of what, what I call compression expansion exercises where you play passages that are very tight and close together to ones that are very open where you're playing chords. Or I'll, I will do scales. I'll do them in thirds or in sixths or something like that. I'll make up my own exercises where I put something in like a an odd time signature because I want to be able to, let's say, repeat a pattern. And if it's an odd odd time signature i could arrange it so that each finger gets an accent like if you're using all all five fingers i could put it in a, a rhythm of six and then all of a sudden you know I've, every finger kind of gets a turn accenting so i'm really into that and I'll, you'll see me you know if you're hanging out with me i'll be working you know even on a tabletop just kind of doing you know interesting rhythmic patterns to keep my fingers in, in really good shape but i've also as i said before i've been practicing a lot of guitar lately too so i'm I'm almost like a habitual you know practicer in that sense um and i just love it i love the focus of it it's almost a it's calming it's a meditation it keeps my hands feeling really good and you were all a little a little crazy like that in dream theater you know everybody's got their uh, everybody's kind of the same in 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 the sense that they're working they're always working on their instrument and doing what they feel is you know gonna keep things uh in a great place the the, the go-to instrument for for yourself there seems to be the guitar uh, as a side thing if you like um would, would would the drums be of equal measure for you or uh, do you veer towards a guitar because of the you know the melodic um you know stringy element to it as opposed to it being say a uh, a percussive you know, I am, um, I'm very, um, connected with my, with my hands and my fingers. So, so instruments that use the dexterity that I've developed, and that could be a guitar or a keyboard or not so much like wind instruments because that's involved involving a whole nother thing, but like, you know, I play the continuum and I'll play the seaboard and I played the harpeggi and I, I like playing different instruments. And of course, you know, my, my own invention, geo shred which is an iOS based instrument. I play that too. Matter of fact, I play that every night on stage during a view from the top of the world, the cello solo on that, on, on the iPad. So, so that's an instrument that I, that I play as well. So Jordan, looking at the mathematical components uh, to what you do in dream theory, and, and, and I guess equally what you're doing in your, your solo stuff, obviously you're using metronomes, clicks, in a live situation does that keep you on your toes or is it something that you're somewhat immune to whereby it just flows on the night and you're not really even thinking about it because let's face it you're playing some complex stuff yeah that's a good question because um you know a lot of musicians use odd time signatures and it becomes very um kind of what is the word i'm looking for you know, not organic or natural. They just go oh, academic. That, that's the thing. We, well, academic is the right word because meaning that they're doing it because they're doing it. I feel like in my life with, with you know, using using rhythms that are not just in 4-4 four, four time, you know, like other things, I've been able to kind of internalize them to the point where I'll be kind of composing something or even thinking of something without necessarily being that conscious of it and all of a sudden i go oh my god that's in seven so my point of that is that it that it becomes a natural thing and i think it, you know there are times like in a song like these walls by dream theater where the where the the verses and everything have these odd times but you don't even re it's not like if they're hitting you in the face and you're thinking this is quote unquote odd it can really flow and it's just a thing and it's a different kind of a uh it's a different kind of an energy about it and and that's and that's one of the ways that I kind of, you know, work with odd time signatures just because they flow and they're natural to me. So they can come out that way. The other thing is that they can be used in a way to kind of spin your head around and be, you know, something where it's like, oh, my God, what is that? And they can have a certain energy about it. Like when I'll use the um, new title track, um, View from the Top of the World. Uh, for that as well, like the whole the whole ending where we're banging out this theme and the drums are kind of doing one thing, we're hitting the and the guitar and the keyboard are playing this theme and it's in a really odd time signature and it and I do have to personally I have to count it a little bit 
but I feel that the energy is very unique. It's really cool. And it gets very heavy, like very intense. It's a real dream theater thing to be, I think, even able to do that between all of us. So I think that it's like a tool, you know, those are, those are interesting tools for us to use, to have different effects, you know, on the, on the listener and different, just different um, kind of meaning behind the music. I would love to know your thoughts on improvisation, Jordan, and quite specifically, spontaneous improvisation. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yes. Well, I'm, I'm an improviser. I, <clears throat> Dream Theater as a band, we don't go on stage and do much improvisation. In the old days, we do a little bit here and there. Um, but myself, like when I do my solo concerts, like tonight, I'll, um, I'll usually walk on stage and I'll go right into an improvisation. <clears throat> and I do it because when I'm improvising, I can be really true to myself and true to the room. And I can just kind of, I, I, you know, my, my feeling is that I'm sensing what's going on in my own body and mind and also what's going on in the room and I can react to it. And can I just play whatever comes into my head. And so like, you know, one of my, um, one of my old bandmates in a group called the Paul, Paul Winter Consort said to me one day we were just like, you know, it was be- we were just rehearsing and I was just playing, you know, off the top of my head. He's like, Jordan, you throw away more good music than most people write in their lives. Because, And I thought that that was an interesting perspective because the reality is whether, you know, a lot of other people judge whether it's good enough. But when I'm when I sit down at the piano, I could play all day and it's just stuff you've never heard before. It's just coming out of my head. So that's just who I, that's just who I am. Um, and that's, and that's also a tool. The improvisation is also a tool for writing. Like I, you know, if we sit down and John Petrucci says to me, Jordan, you know, what, can you write, you know, something like really, really big and proud and, you know, I'll just start playing something, you know, like that's how, uh, going back to like six degrees of inner turbulence, we, we, John and I laugh about it because we were out in the studio. I'd gotten a new chord keyboard. It was called a karma and that was inspiring in itself. And he was, just, he was just like presenting ideas to me and we were rolling the tape, you know, like play a love theme, you know, play a, play a, you know, something really with a big climax to it, play this, play that. And so a bunch of the themes and a bunch of the music got written that way because it was, you know, turned out that it was some good stuff. So people who want to improvise need to understand that basically you're putting together uh, almost like musical phrases or words. You can think of it as like a musical vocabulary. So one needs to learn, um, you know, a, a, a collection, if you will, of, of riffs and of ideas and call it scales or whatever, and how to string them together. So when you're improvising, you can think of a melody and then you can, you know, put the chords below it because you know where those chords are. And maybe you have patterns that you've played before. I mean, you know, and different improvisers can go at it in different ways. Uh, you know, guitar players usually think in shapes, you know, so they're putting, they're putting shapes together when they're improvising. I'm thinking, you know, more kind of like the notes and the, and the riffs on the keyboard. But, um, but I do believe that, you know, people can learn it to a point. I mean, I also believe in, I also really believe that, you know, musical talent is a real thing. And some people just don't really have the natural kind of ear for it, you know, and they, they just, you know, if they hear, they can't really hear something and have any idea what the notes are and maybe never would or will. <laughs> That's a problem, you know, but if you have some natural ability, then I do think it's something that can be developed. Now, let me ask you this. What was it like reconnecting with Mike Portnoy on the most recent LTE album, Liquid Tension Experiment 3? There must have been, it must have been a fun process. Um, it was really fun. I mean, we, it was like, we didn't even miss a beat, you know, it was just, we went right back to work and we, <laughs> we started where we left off. Basically it was, you know, we all got along really well and enjoyed being in the studio. It was very productive. We had some good laughs and good times and, uh, and managed to come out with some good music. And I'm looking forward to doing that again. Hey guys, this is Roy Conn of Conception and you're listening to Prog Rock Digital.